I show first time my film Forgiveness in New York. In the opening night, Mariam Said came and read some poems of our friend, the late Mahmoud Darwish, before the opening of the film. And I felt that for me as an Israeli Jew to be so privileged to open something like that in New York, that the name Said and Darwish are together, it's better than an Oscar. So, um, I'm not sure that my talk will be on the film. The film is, is there as well, but um, if I could name the talk again, I would call it, and who shall I say is calling. And you know the song probably of uh, Leonard Cohen, but it's also a prayer from the Yom Kippur. And this talk, it's about two calls. And, and really it was kind of a written talk, but after I heard Ariella, Yedin, Judith, I felt that I'm in a discussion also. So it will be some written part and some uh, chaotic part that I'll try to make sense. Um, before I start to explain who the calls came from, I want to open. Um, so this scene uh, in my film, Forgiveness, taking place in the trauma zone that called Dir Yassin, that as one who could read it, after Israel, militia, Jewish militia murdered the Palestinian people there. When Israel state came, they built the mental institute on the ruins or in the houses of Dir Yassin, and the first people who were committed were Holocaust survival. And this place that the victims of the Nakba are speaking with the Muslims of the Shoah together create for me really the place where binationalism can start. It's a place of the mutual trauma in a way of the two nations. It was important for me, and this is in relate to Ariella talk, that the word I choose in Hebrew wasn't for forgiveness, wasn't slichot, the word that people usually use, but it's mechilot. Because mechilot, it is forgiveness, but it's also underground tunnel. 
and the, the issues that the regular forgiveness, it's impossible in this situation. We have first to put the resistance. We have first to put the fidelity. And only from this position and through the trembling the underground as Freud opened, uh, if we cannot change the law, if you remember, that's how we opened the, the interpretation of a dream, we should tremble the underground. Uh, and I thought that to go there to Kfar Shaul, it was so important. Well, what is in Hebrew Kfar Shaul? Everyone thinks Kfar Shaul is a village on the name of Saul. And even though we ever speak Hebrew here, I don't know if I tell them that Kfar Shaul also means in Hebrew borrowed village. And even though they all said it, they don't get how cunning Hebrew can be, that it's a village that we should give back one day. And, and in this place, I thought to start this journey that I speak about. Before I go to the two calls again, or how I could be able to listen to the call, because it's not enough that somebody call you, you have to be in a place that you can hear the call. I want to see where is the place that I felt that I have to change the word sricha to mechira, or regular forgiveness to, to kind of a underground forgiveness. And I was in the two seminars of uh, the redound forgiveness with uh, Avital Ronel, the Gavin NYU. One was before September 11 and one was after. And maybe if the text was kind of similar, the whole feeling was totally different. It was, he was already sick, we smelled September 11, and the second seminar, I don't think I hardly hear anything, I more experience it. And I thought that I'm kind, now how I control this, I have no idea. So I thought to show what is, how you can take, philo to do applied philosophy, this naive act sometimes. So, I did something like that, if I find it. I went to Chairman Arafat to try to ask forgiveness when he's in the curfew in the Mukata. What the Israeli people should do in order for the Palestinians to forgive us for all the wrongdoing we did on the last few years? <laughs> We have to return back to the piece of the bread which I had signed with my partner in Arabic, which means that two states are living together side by side. So I stop for a second here. What you see here is you see I'm trying to ask forgiveness, counting from 48, and I get back the official answer of the two-state solution, but also I have here on the other side my mom. So it's almost because my mom is, in a second we'll speak about her, but she's the civil rights fighter in Israel. She fight for gay rights before the new dark gays in Israel, I think. She realized more and more that she has to fight for a Palestinian over the time. And when she got two leftist people said that she's doing it with Arafat, so this is almost was daddy and mommy are meeting for me. And in all the sexual jokes, of course, against the left that uh, you know. But the interesting part was that both of them gave me back the answer of the impossibility of, of the one. He with the official answer, and my mom I'm going to show you in a sec. Again, how we control this. I make this smaller. I go to here and I look for mommy. <laughs> <laughs> Who we'll speak about? <laughs> so. Now, 
אז מה כולנו הזדעזענו על זכות השיבה? מפני שאנחנו לא רוצים את זה, כי אנחנו וזה חיסול של המדינה. ומה את חושבת? אני גם חושבת שאם אנחנו עושים שתי מדינות ואתה תיתן פה זכות שיבה, אתה גמרת את מדינת ישראל. כי תהיה מדינה אחת פלסטינאית ואחת דו-לאומית שאנחנו נהיה במדינות. אבל... ואז באיזון האינטרסים זה לא נכון. ואתה לא מתקן עוול לך, אבל לידי זה... אני לא... אתם, איזה עוול אני מתקן? לא אמרתי שהוא יחזור לאדמה אם מישהו גר שם יהודי. אז הוא יחזור לארץ ישראל, למדינה שלנו. חמישים שנה אין מדינת פלסטין כבר? מ-49 אין מדינת פלסטין? עודד, אין לך שום מדינת פלסטין. שנינו יודעים על מה אתה חושב ועל מה אני חושב. זה הנקוד, זה הודעה. My mom. <laughs> so I can't leave you here to listen to this. Neither you. I don't know. Let's close him. Let's do this. Just to tell you, the, the story was that after this film and this scene that when then I was married, my wife told me, don't put it on the film, it's really embarrassing how she shut you down. <laughs> and I thought that this is really the moment of the different, of the particular and really the impossibility to move to the other side. And the funny thing that Judy told me that she had exactly the same experience with my mom, going with her in the car, remember that this scene she saw already as a deja vu, And then she told him, but why are you against the right of return? And they're in the middle of the desert, right? And she said, but don't you see there is no place for everyone here? <laughs> <laughs> so it's happened twice. And all this talk is about twice. It's about two calls. And really, my talk today is a split into two by a murder. Uh, perhaps I should say it by a double murder. the mythological murder of Moses, and the concrete murder of my dearest friend, Giuliano. I think that during the talk, if I have time, the concrete murder become mythological one, and the mythological become concrete one. But it's also structured as Freud wrote Moses and monotheism, because it's about the revelation, the murder, the denial, and the return of the repress, in a way. So if I can hold all this in the five hours I have to speak now, um, we'll do it. But um, I received two calls. And my talk today is about to respond to those two calls. The first is the call of the late Edward Said and his text, Freud and the Non-European which I experience as a revelation more than an academic text. And I experience it as a call in the language. And the second call is the call of the late Giuliano Merchamis, the son of a Palestinian father and a Jewish mother. Uh, they met in the Communist Party in Israel, Palestine. And if the former call was in the language, the latter is in the body. And when you speak about the body with Giuliano, it is also the body, because he was like the most handsome man. When, when Tony Kushner spoke on his behalf, he said, you know, it was really a few weeks after Jul died, and he said, it was so hot. And I think it's part of Giuliano's appearance, this beauty also, this charisma, this body that includes everything, the actor. Also his performance, there are amazing performances that he do in his body, in Tel Aviv, in uh, West Bank. So, so I, this talk is really responding to those two calls. I'm not a good reader in English, but I feel that I have to read this call. It's the end of the text of uh, Edward Said, and it's interesting for me when it came on 2003, the book, I think, and my film ended in 2002, and you understand that I felt in my film that I'm like on the border. It's like almost my mom performing like to be Moses in uh, Mount Nevo, that she cannot come to the land, but not to the land of Canaan, but to the land of binationalism. And 
And in this time that I, I felt confused and also just to think on two status, binational didn't work to me because binationalism felt something for me more also spiritual. By two state, it's kind of a pragmatic solution, either working or not. I heard this Said writing, <clears throat> the question that Freud therefore leaves us with are, can so utterly indecisive and so deeply undetermined a history ever be written? In what language and in what sort of vocabulary? Can it aspire to the conditions of politics of diaspora life? Diaspora life. Can it ever become the non so precarious foundation in the land of Jews and Palestinians of a binational state in which Israel and Palestine are parts rather than antagonists of each other's history and underlying reality. I myself believe so. And that last text, I myself believe so, of Said, I wanted to echo it, I myself believe so too. And this call was for me of me, the Israeli Jew, reading the Palestinian, reading the European Jew, reading the Egyptian Israeli, and it's this repetition of the possibility of, really I felt that what I learned that there's nothing further than be a Jew than be just a Jew. And I felt how I can cross this border that my mom as a collective person, maybe the best person of the Zionist left couldn't cross. And I realized in order to respond, I wouldn't be sufficient enough just to blur the border. I had to cross the border. And in order to do it, I had to act with conviction and to perform two radical acts. The first act was a decision to join the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement, BDS. And I want to say, joining the BDS, I don't think really the Palestinians really need me too much to join the BDS. I don't think also that people who don't join it are doing something wrong. It's not that, uh, especially if they want to work inside the community. And, but the way I started is with, funny enough, it was with an article I published that said, and who shall I say is calling, calling Leonard Cohen not to play Israel. So already the call was there. And I gained by that, I felt two things. I can't read and speak, so I'll speak and whatever. I gained one thing, it was the only act, as me, as a male Ashkenazi Jew in Israel, it would be the only act that the Israeli game of playing democracy can, cannot take in. I could say whatever I want, but once I, I joined the academic and cultural boycott, it's where they had to reject my, my talk. Everything else, I could be the cool radical leftist artist within the community. So I had to act a violence act toward my own privilege, because there is something nice to be there. And if I wanted to cross, I, I have to try to cross. And the second thing it was to show a full fidelity to the Palestinians. And I thought it was important to act to show fidelity to the one who don't have any sovereignty. So with those two acts, I was ready, I think, to the second call. And it was my dearest friend, Giuliano Melchamis, the founder of the Freedom Theater in Janine Refugee Camp. He invited me to join him there, even though no Israeli Jew could be welcomed in the Janine refugee camp. And in a dialectic way, my support for BDS, which seems to close doors on my Israeliness, is what opened the door for the possibility of a true dialogue through true solidarity with the Palestinian. But even more so, only when I crossed the border to Janine could I feel like a Jew again. And that's a very important thing for me, that this pure fidelity that, that some people said, I lost your community, I really gained something really much bigger. And first I knew that I'm Jew because everyone said, hey, he's a Jew, he's a Jew. So let's not try to make everything nice. But also I could perform my Jewishness, and in a second I will explain it. But mostly because of my dear friend, Jules. 
Because Jew tell me, okay, you come here, we're going to work together, everything, but I agree only if every week you continue to write to this biggest newspaper in Israel. Because I don't agree that you will give up on your own community. And I realized that really this move to Jenin wasn't giving up on my community. It was almost a performative act speaking with my own community, saying that that move is also a move in a dialogue with them. Jewel, I want to say something on uh, Jewel here. Because we were in, we were really in euphoria. We we felt you have to. He's as I said, very eloquent. We work on Alice in Wonderland. That whoever saw many people saw yesterday the film. I'm going to show a little bit, but uh, we work on Alice in Wonderland. The Arab Spring really was knocking on the door. We were working at night in. A, we worked at night uh, really on uh, Antigone uh, in Janine refugee camp, a, a scream ride that we wanted to shoot a big feature. And I just heard yesterday from Judith that he told her, Judith, because she, she's a member, there are a few members here, it's also very touch of the Freedom Theater from the Janine refugee camp. And he told her, Judith, I read your book on Antigone, I didn't understand anything, but Udi will explain me. And and it was more serious than she thought, and I'm, I'm going to explain why, because while we're working on all these things, at night, really, we were sitting and, and studying. And I want to explain it why, why I spoke on my Jewishness there, because we try to build a system how we work on all those things. And the reason I had here, because I thought I might show you, So we try to put something together really that connect theory, art, and action together. And that's all the name also that we spoke before. Maybe I should have. Hello. <laughs> Much better. <laughs> um, so we didn't like art as resistance. We like art as art, resistant as resistance, art as art as resistance, resistant as art. There are many options, and what we try to do is art, theory, and action to be connected to each other, that each one will be, in a way, a mean to the other and an aim to itself. And the way we work on it, so then I put it together with, uh, so I do a small detour now, and teaching the Star of Redemption first class of Franz Rosenzweig. So, Rosenzweig, when he put the Star of Redemption, he put God here, that I put as Elohim, Aleph. He put the human here, that I put Adam as Aleph. And he put the world here, that I put Aretz as Aleph. And in the middle, we have Aleph also, that it's I, Ani, it's Acher, other. So we have also the Aleph here. And I try to say that when Rosenzweig built this, I will sign it after. Um, he put the relationship between God and the God and human as revelation. The relationship between God and the, and the world as creation. And the relationship between human and the world as redemption. And that's very important that in this place of redemption, God is not in this relationship. It's, it's the responsibility of the one. But, uh, and we spoke there at night and the idea was that in the Moderna, in the 20th century, maybe after the Holocaust, the Aleph were split. God would cut to two in a way. Some people say he died in Auschwitz, some said he was in his almighty. Humankind was split. Did he die there 
or show is all modernity with the technology of death. The world, we know all the ecology questions. So it's all split, it's all fall apart. And how we could get this structure without the God that is not not God, but is God and not God and all that. And we realize that it's really, we keep the same things that really the revelation become the theory. And it's very important to read this theory and study it night and everything because we have to know what we want to the world even if there is no wall to fight against it. And the creation is the art. And the redemption is activism, is action. And this is what we try to keep all the time. And I'm doing it first because I enjoy teaching those things, but to tell you the, the heterogenic life that we have in, in Janine with Jules and everyone, that we would do Alice, we would study stuff, we speak in fighting on feminism with hijab or without hijab. And then at night we can go to text like that. So it was really a moment that we felt we can change the world. So we, more than euphoria, maybe we were almost manic in this place of that all our sides together are functioning together in a way. And in this place, I want to show you a small part of ever the, how Jews speak about Alice in Wonderland. مرحبا انا مريم ابو خالد ممثله فلسطينيه من جنين جوليان عمر خميس اسس مسرح الحريه في مخيم اللاجئين في جنين مدينتي لمده ثلاث سنين جول علمني مسرح وتمثيل بس بالحقيقه هو علمني الحريه والنضال والفن جول علمني كيف احلم أليس هي مش أجنبية أنا أنا بفرقش بين أليس محلية وأليس أجنبية في أليس في شي فن أجنبي وفن محلي في فن هوية الفن هي هوية الفنان فأليس هي بنت فتاة فلسطينية بتمرك مرحلة تحرر زي العالم العربي اليوم فأنا كنت بيكي بقول لك بشكل مثلي إنه الجو الهواء من الثورة العربية اللي عمالها بتصير بليبيا في مصر في تونسيا فاتت في بواب مسرح الحرية وعمالها تنفخ على منصة مسرح الحرية So this place was a place that really we felt that we can join almost like the particularity with universality, understanding the politics of the of identities with the universal uh, place that Giuliano came from. And then he was murdered in front of the theater in uh, April 4th, the same day of uh, Martin Luther King, in front of the theater in Janin. We worked in the theater night and day to create our cultural bomb, but we weren't sufficiently careful, and it went off in our lap and took Giuliano's life at the height of his bloom. What language does one choose to say Kaddish for a Shahid of art who came from a Palestinian Christian family and was himself communist? People like to say that Giuliano was Jew in Palestine and Palestinian in Israel, and Jew like to say that he's 100% Palestinian and 100% Jewish. But for me, Jew was a Palestinian Jew everywhere. He was human everywhere. He wanted to free the Palestinian from the Israelis, the women from the men, the poor from the rich, and the people in general from their own boundaries. I felt that I came to learn from Jew the way of binationalism, step by measure step. But his loss put me 
it felt almost like losing the best friend, but also losing a mythological one. And after the murder, I felt that maybe Giuliano wasn't neither a Jew, neither Palestinian, like the two community cannot even hold the possibility of the other within himself. So after we went to a group of students, we went to Ramallah, away from Janin, and I tried to go a little bit faster, even though it's many details that are creating the story, but we went, we, we didn't feel safe in Janin. For me to leave Janin, it's almost obvious, without Jewel, it's not my home. For them, it's like be away from a home, a home that called refugee camp. So you understand that it went another step from the other home or the original home that they never had. And we work on waiting for Godot there, that waiting for Godot was for us the place of exile, the place of impossibility, the place that we hardly exist. And I want to show you a part from there, a small one. Militant art is the art of the weak. The person who barely exists in the public sphere. The person whose density is hardly noticed in the political world. Militant art is the artist's ability to create power from that position of weakness. Those willing to take risk for the sake of art will be those who create the beginnings of a new art. Even before Jules was murdered, suddenly I felt to write, maybe against our mind, like to write, we speak from the position of weakness, or whole weakness. And I feel the displaced to go and do art as a presentation and not a representation. And how much time I have? I don't know. Okay, so it's a question if I do the split or not, but so I won't go into what I think militant art. I want, but there is a meaning for me. I don't against official art. You know, people do amazing stuff in this representation of, of ideology that already exists. But militant art, in a way, for me, it's the art of presentation because we don't know what is the ideological or the framework we are working in. We don't know who is the audience. We don't. It's a place that art and life are the same, and that's why death is coming there to stop it. It's a place of extreme vulnerability, and it's very important to speak that the militant place is a place of, to create a place that from hardly existence, you create your identity. You live on the border, you don't have a space, and from that position, you can act. But more and more after the murder, and then we try, I try to keep everything together and to keep this to find in Godot, in the repetition, the opening in the repetition. You know, they put, there is a beautiful moment, Didi put the coat on Gogo and said, like, sleep tonight, and this is an opening in the despair of repetition. It's a way of dealing with mourning and not immediately run for revenge. But when uh, Maram and Batu went back to the camp to do Peter Pan by themselves with Rami. It's a whole group. Maram and Batu, they are here, so I speak, but it's a group. They went back, and we made this film, and we thought, well, we, we, we did something. And, but then they were really very, there was a lot of tension in their community. And when I came back, I was attacked furiously in Israel. And the time of two years for Giuliano came and I was really missing him. And suddenly I felt that doubt came all over me. All this place of acting from fidelity and all that, it was something was missing. The body 
of binationalism in a way fail. And it's true that there is the story how it's continued with all those amazing friends that came to work with, but I felt that I want to go back to the original text. And now in the little time I want to say I cannot develop it, but I have to go back to, to the text and not to the action, like to withdraw a little bit. And when I read Said text again and I go and I read Freud text again and I put it as a Talmudic page and I put Yerushalmi here and Freud here and Said here and Derrida with the archives here and some other things. And I was feeling that there I might find again in the first call kind of an answer to continue. And the answer was that the beauty that I enjoy in the text also. And the thing I cannot develop also, I want to speak only on a very important thing, circumcision. Freud really created a whole story that after Yerushalmi try, as Derrida put, come and told him, no, no, tell that you're a Jew, tell you're a Jew, to his specter after he's dead, like in panic. And Said wrote Freud with so much grace and understanding and exception that to know that there is something there. I want to say that Yerushalmi have a right intuition why he was so furious to, to try to call Freud back to be just a Jew. Because when I read this text again, I realized Freud, Freud have a whole wrong concept of what monotheism is in a way. Because the monotheism he spoke about is the monotheism of Islam or maybe Protestants. Judaism never had this abstract God that you cannot touch the one. And he brought it from Athens. So I thought if, if what happened if Freud is not a Jew? What happened if he's not European? And what happened if he is non-European? And really the story you could tell all the time he spoke, I, I won't go into because uh, you spoke about it, five minutes, there is no way to do it in five minutes. So I'll just give you a hint to think about it. Freud all the time speak about the murder of the father and that Moses is not, is a Egyptian really. But in the text, there is a beautiful moment that, that Freud ignore even though he mentioned it. That really God came to murder in the desert. God came to murder Moses. And in the last moment, Zipporah, the wife, is circumcised the, the, her little son and threw the blood on God in order like do a magic. So this event is the opposite of everything Freud want to hear because it's really the murder of the infant. It's the magic and the woman who saved the situation. And you realize that it's exactly what happened at the first time when Pharaoh came to kill the infant and said all the firstborn will die. And again, the one who saved it is the, is the mother, is the woman, is the Egyptian. And Freud liked to tell this, now I don't have time for his joke here, and really, when, when God come to murder Moses, it's when Moses is going on the way to Pharaoh to tell him, I'm going to kill all your firstborn. So there is a whole fight of killing the, the babies. And Freud all the time insists of the killing of the father. So when he write about Paul, he said, Paul got a good intuition that the Jew killed the, that the Jews killed the God, but they got it wrong because they think that he thought that they killed the son, but not really the father. We can tell him Paul got it totally right. It is a repetition of killing of the son. It's exactly what's happened. Paul got it right. And I feel that Shylock really understood it so well because when Paul tried to bring it to his religion and said, we don't need the circumcision in the flesh, but we need the circumcision in the heart, that that's what Paul said, what Shylock is doing. He do the circumcision of the heart itself. He said, I want the flesh from the heart. He's bringing it back to the body. So really, if we want to tell the story, it would be Musa and the religion of the monotheism. It started in Egypt. It was murdered and followed as a denial in, in the tribe that went out. And when it came back, when it came back to the, to the Arabs, it created the, the true monotheism like Aton. And Freud said that, but Islam didn't have this repetition of the murder. 
that really the killing of Hussein uh, ibn Ali, it's exactly the repetition again of killing of the, of the one that should come in the future. So what I try to say, I try to close it, that I can tell that through the story of the circumcision, I can tell the story as a Christian one, as a Muslim one, but I really would think that what Freud tried to tell us is something different. Freud was a prophet. He spoke about the future, not on the past. Because all of us, in what we do, we are like Schwarzenegger in the, the Terminator. We send people to the past to read the past again in order to change the present and the future. And I think what Freud tried to tell us, and I want to finish maybe with this, he said, remember, part of the anti-Semitism, it's a beautiful text of Freud, it's not the hate to the Jew as the other, or to hate the Jew as the one who killed Christ. It's the hate that many Christians have to the one who forced them to be Christians. And because they cannot hate Christianity itself, because they're already Christian, they hate the Jew as the Christian. And Freud suddenly understood that the Jew and the Christian, in a way, are one. And I thought that in this text, he prepared himself to be murdered. I think that he prepared himself to be murdered in order to resurrect again in the future as the European Jew. And what Said, I think, offer us, and I cannot develop it, so maybe in the question, is that we can build the same concept of going back in Palestine to the possibility of being the non-European Jew on the same structure, because in Europe, really, we needed the Holocaust in order that the Jew will Re reborn as kind of a super ego of Europe. And then they, in Europe, they're acting as the moral radical liberals. And in Israel, they're acting as the nostalgia for old colonialism. But we have to go out to a different place to be part of this new place. And because I jump on serious things, maybe they are, it's lacking the logic. But the option is really the option of to create the non-European Jew in Israel. Palestine. And the last thing I want to say for this call, of course I skip on so much, but who cares? So how can I respond to Said call now, after everything I went through? Maybe I cannot say like him, I believe so. But I can try with alternative narratives and alternative action and new mythologies, and new theology and politics, I can try to help to make it happen. Thank you. I would like just to ask if uh, taking into consideration the different forms of art resistance that was uh, published and undertaken by Palestinian writers such as Ghassan Kanavani. Do you see uh, your work interrelated or connected or extensively intertwined with the previous works uh, published by Palestinian writers in the context of the works of Ghassan Kanavani? Or are we talking about a new form of art resistance by uh, the example of uh, Jenin, uh, uh, the camp of uh, freedom in uh, Jenin? And that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Second question. Hi there. Um, I was just wondering, how much do you think um, nonviolent civic action can actually affect change? How much the, what? How much do you think nonviolent civic action can actually affect change in this kind of a situation? And when you make a film, do you, are you more interested in having a worldwide response and bringing the message outwards, or are you more interested in it being important for the insular community and just to... Um, for example, the women in the film, is it more important that they feel like they're resisting and that they have power, or is it more important to get that message out to the world? Thank you. And the third question over there, please. Thank you. Ihaba from Palestine. Taking in, uh, into consideration the Freedom Theater Engineering Refugee Camp, founded by Arna Hamis and Israeli and Jewish, they destroyed it in, uh, in 2002. After that, Giuliano with Zakaria Zubaydi rebuilt it at 2006 to give drama and art for the Palestinian children. During what the theater pro uh, produced, Al Jazeera concert play. This talk about the way of the Jewish treat a Palestinian prisoners 
at Israel's prison. Taking into consideration the, prisoner, the prison's arrest of more than 5,000, 15 of them from legalistic council members, 170 administrative detainees, and more than 200 under 18 years old. Regarding what Giuliano said about art resistance, my point focus on art which we can, as a Palestinian, explain our daily suffering from Israelis. Also, Samir al isawi a Palestinian prisoner, entered a hunger strike from the 1st of August last year. My question, in short, is in your view, how can a Palestinian living under direct Israeli occupation use art as a member of expressing their suffering and speaking up against the Israeli options? Thank you. Thank you. Udi, would you like to respond to those yeah, three um, questions? Let's try to get it together. I'm not sure I understood everything, but you can correct me first. I want to speak about nonviolence. It's very important for me to say, I think that the violence of the oppressed is justified. I want to repeat it clearly. I think the violence of the oppressed is justified. What we try to do is to make it not necessary. So it's not that I'm coming from the original place of nonviolence. I come to nonviolence as a new opening, a new space. And I experienced the same thing in, uh, in when I shoot in with Jammu Kashmir Liberation Front. And I did show the result of uh, JKLF to the al Brigade as well, to show that in the end, when you do arm resistance in this time, it has this time that was important, in Laila Haled time and all that. I think that if we don't transform to it, what's happened in, uh, in, in uh, Kashmir and what's happened in Palestine, is first you begin to be controlled by the one who gave you the weapon. Suddenly the Kashmiri freedom fighter fought for Pakistan instead of the Kashmir. So you have the one who controlled the money and the weapon control you. Second, somehow, from all the weapons that I saw in Janin refugee camp, that I refused to take any part of it because who I am, that I'm, I'd rather die not to be part in any arm resistance. But as a viewer who doesn't want to judge, I noticed that all the weapon didn't use for any operation against Israel. It's only used against each other. So I think that this amazing opening that Bir'in, Arin, the unarmed resistance, I called it, because I want still to respect the stone as part of, from David, King David to Edward Said, Jester, but the unarmed res resistance plus the BDS, that it's another opening to a non-violence resistance, plus art, all of them together give an option in today's environment, I think to promote more, more uh, freedom without creating reactionary power within your own society. That's the way I see it. And, and about the art, I think that what Giuliano and myself felt we don't try to do dialogues, art of Jews, Israelis, and Palestinians together. We came in solidarity. We are the one who move in solidarity to work with the Palestinians. And we thought that only from this position, because today what we have, we have Israel, that it's one place, it's one language, one freedom. In the movie I show how they can move everywhere. And we have Palestine that it's totally even doesn't have a name. You have the 48ers, you have West Bank, you have East Jerusalem, you have Gaza, you have the exile, no one even can touch each other. So we felt that in order to create this place, this space for forgiveness, this space for dialogue, this space for binationalism, first you have to create the national movements of the Palestinians to make them also a sovereign with a name. Because for me, binationalism, it's not the end of the process. It's not like the utopic place. Binationalism for me, just the beginning of the dialogue. It's only the beginning of the process is binationalism. Just that first you have two entities, the right to be also Palestinian. The same way that I have the obvious without even speak to be Israeli Jew. So I, I said that I want to postpone my right as an Israeli Jew until the Palestinian can say, I'm a Palestinian. So that's how we work and what we do there, if I understood your question right or not, we work 
with the Palestinians to create art, everything, and by that, by the Palestinians including us within them, it's first, it's a beautiful thing for us, but I think the way Said offered uh, in his text, I think it's also very good for the Palestinian, because also you don't want to be just Palestinian. You want to be able to include the one who's ready to march with you the fight. Um, is there any burning question? Uh, okay, we will take that one um, and then we will close it. Uh, thank you very much for this amazingly interesting talk. I'm Palestinian from Gaza. Uh, and I'm very much, very much interested in the, you know, sort of uh, art resistance work that is done by both internationals, Israelis, by international Israelis and Palestinians in the occupied Palestinian territories in order to, as a means of resisting the Israeli occupation and oppression uh, inflicted on the Palestinians. But, uh, there's, there's something that I wanted to point out, and I'm not sure if you agree with me, but it seems to me that most of this artistic expression uh, that is uh, focused in the occupied Palestinian territories, mostly in the West Bank, is not actually done by uh, Palestinians themselves, but it's rather done by internationals. Sort of, you know, these theater uh, works, performance, uh, uh, documentaries, for example, uh, Budros, uh, which is which has been recently released, uh, it seems to me that mo the bulk of work is done by internationals, and you know it seems there is a fine line between Israelis or internationals who work side by side with the Palestinians in order to speak up for the Palestinians, and or in order to enable the Palestinians to speak up for themselves, and those who rather in an orientalist way, allow me to say, uh, impose their own uh, understanding or their own uh, perception of the conflict on the Palestinians and they actually want to give voice to the Palestinians. Um, I don't want to uh, give any names. I, I got your point and yeah. I kind of agree with you and I, so I want to elaborate on it a bit. Thank you, thank you. Um, part of my criticism now on some NGO organization and also for me today, and it can be changed, maybe because of the loss of Jew, but in the Freedom Theater, that really many, you see it really badly in the movie Cinema Janin, that the German guy come almost as a Christian to build them a cinema and do self-praising to himself while doing it. I think that what our community, if you saw our film also, it was all Palestinians that worked there, except me that I feel I'm kind of converted, but there's no international at all, there's no NGO money. And when I said all Palestinian, the beauty in this film and this new agenda that coming, that we destroyed the 48 line. When I said it was, this film was co-producer, Tamer Nafar, Mindam, Shadia came, Shadia, so you have Shadia Mansour from the exile coming and, praising the heroes of Gaza, and you have Dam that, that you know, Min Rabi and all that, and you have Saleh Bakri and Amir Khrechi, and everyone in this film, for example, that we did, it's a new community, I think, and I think that also you see it, you see it on the new film of Hani Abu Asa, and I think with Ilya Suleiman you see it. So I think there is the NGO thing, those international coming, putting money, controlling with their money, the progressive things, and. And I have also, you know, and try to tell kind of a European story through them. But I think, and maybe it was important, we cannot all the time just make fun of it. You know, that there are times that NGOs were important. You have to create some of basic. But now, I think that maybe the new generation of Palestinian artists are re reclaiming it back and doing amazing stuff. And uh, for me, like Iyad uh, Khourani, uh, that was my student, now is in the main role next to Saleh Bakri in, uh, in Hani Abu Asa film. And uh, Mariam and Batur that did this film with me and with Tamer went back to Janine and put Peter Pan by themselves in cinema Janine. So if you, and we didn't take any NGO money, we really like guerrilla fighters, it's pretty much. But in the other hand, instead of international getting big salaries, we have all the people that I'm sure you know them as artists, all of them, like Tamer, Suhel, 
everyone work voluntarily. So Hel Overtime, that is the brother of Tamer that sing with him in Dam, is amazing editor, coming at night to edit. Tamer that is really busy translating stuff from Arab. It's so there is a new community, and for this community, I want to join as an Israeli Jew that want to feel Palestinian. And I do took distance from the internationals, I have to admit, I understand, but I don't want to condemn them. I want also for us not to condemn the NGO and the international, but take them and try to bring them to a new place that they'll be more as assistants and not the one who move it. But they have things to give. And if it's the end, it is the end. So I just want to say something, one more thing on Freud that I don't, uh, <laughs> I have to. <laughs> Because it was all this fascination with circumcision <laughs> that it's so beautiful because really forgot that it's really Muslim and Jews together. It's what keep us together against the West. And then the West tried to take it away from us in America. But really the interesting part is that everyone said that they tried to prove that in Egypt were circumcision and circumcision, that's the proof that Moses is Egyptian and that the, the Israel in the desert are part of it. But the interesting part that Moses in the 40 years of the desert didn't do any circumcision to any Israeli. So really the way Israel separate themselves from the Egyptian in this story was by not doing circumcision, not by doing circumcision. So there is a reverse things of how you make yourself different. So we are not only bi-national, we also circumcise and uncircumcise in the same time. Thank you. <laughs>